Hello, my name is Edgar Fernandez from Pharmachemical Safety Limited located in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. Today, this webinar is named How to Use Risk Based Process Safety Skills to be in compliance with ICHQ9 Quality Risk Management in the pharmaceutical industry. <clears throat> this webinar we cover the similarities between the second pillar, understanding the hazard and risk of the risk-based process safety management and ICHQ9 quality risk analysis. This webinar will provide the tools and help to identify the process required information to perform the quality risk by using methodologies in the process hazard analysis, PHA, to determine possible deviations during the process to achieve the good quality of the finished product. The objectives for these webinars are similarities between the second pillar of the risk based process safety and ICHQ9 quality risk management. Understanding of the process information, determine the scope of the quality of risk analysis, who participates, methodologies to perform the quality risk analysis such as fault tree analysis, what if, and hazard and operability analysis, well known as HASOP. Determination of cost, consequence, safeguard, risk ranking, and recommendations, and training. Management systems include quality, environment, and safety. And globally, they are governed by the International Standard Organization for quality, it's 9001. For environment, it's ISO 14001. And safety for OSHA is 18001. You include process you need to review the safety of those elements on, in your uh, manufacturing of any medication that if involves certain uh, materials such as flammable liquids, combustible powders, or you're gonna be about the personal exposure limits of each one of those substances according to NIOSH or to um, any local safety regulation, you need to refer to risk-based process safety. This is the, um, the, the, um, the graphic from, uh, from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, in the United States. They have a subdivision they, or service they call CCPS, it's a Chemical Center of Process Safety. And they have this new approach called risk-based process safety. Um, in the past, actually, process safety, well known as PSM, had 14 elements. They pretty much they were the second, the third, and the fourth pillar. But now they add the commit to process safety. As the same as IC ICHQ9, any any management systems they need to have the commit or the commitment from from top, top management, really to push and create uh, mesh, uh, uh, measures and systems, better to say, um, on how they're gonna approach and fix and assure the safety of the public in case of the pharmaceutical, on the pharmaceutical industry when they manufacture a medication. They need to be able to demonstrate to an abave structure system that they are committing and they are demonstrating and exercising that to prevent any any hazard that is gonna affect or can affect the public or the safety when they buy a medication. Uh, that's the FDA is looking for on ICHQ9, and that's the reason I said in my previous slides, risk-based process safety has a lot of similarities on ICHQ9. And the concept that the ICHQ9 is it's 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 um, driven and is is putting on that standard 
uh, are coming from this uh, type of approach. That's it's uh, my belief. Uh, process safety has been for, for 30 years at least or more. ICQH9 for that approach has been around maybe seven years. So that's the reason why we, um, if as a, uh, we can take advantage if you have in your uh, company um, a people that is specialized in process safety, because now you can use that experience to start implementing the requirements on ICHQ9. So in, co in uh, collaboration with your quality assurance department, QA, that they have all the expertise for GMPs, GMP standards like ICHQ9, ICH, uh, Q10, etc. So you can combine the two departments and, uh, and, and you utilize this type of experience. So uh, the pharmaceutical industry, they have the following components according to the uh, FDA. So the management system, it's um, GMPs that it's uh, uh, regulated by the ICHQ7. The development is the ICHQ8. Risk analysis is the ICHQ9, that is the topic of this uh, webinar. And quality system is the ICU8, ICHQ10, that is uh, has components of the ISO 9001. Um, so these four, those four components, um, uh, make the uh, management system in the pharmaceutical industry. The definitions of hazard and risk are similar under OSHA and under ICHQ-9. Um, on the risk, uh, they are the same as well. And some companies, um, uh, they include frequency as well. So now the risk assessment it's now it's, it's it's calculated by three components probability frequency and severity so in this slide remarks the similarities based on risk definition and both systems offer a systematic approach in this slide another similarity is the risk associated um, for for process process safety it's uh, with the operations and facility and for the uh, ICHQ9 is the risk to quality as you can see on this slide um, the similarity is to assess the activities that are performed through the process um, they call process hazard analysis. Each activity has its own hazard, its own consequence, its own cost, and there are safeguards that we have implemented in the past to reduce the consequence of those hazards. Also needs to be performed the risk assessment, that is a calculation of probability, frequency, and severity. And if the, num of, of the number that is coming out from that calculation is high, so uh, recommended action needs to be implemented to reduce the risk of that hazard. Uh, principles of risk analysis. First is the understanding of the risk associated with the facilities and operations. It's the same for ICHQ9. Is you need, we need to understand the risk associated with the facility and operations to produce a medication that is gonna have a benefit for the patient and it's not gonna jeopardize, jeopardize their safety of the patients. Different questions, but it's the same approach. Understanding of the demand of the process safety activities is the same for ICHQ9. Pharmaceutical companies needs to understand the demand of the activities involved to produce a certain medication. And they need to understand what is the resources to perform those activities. That includes engineering, um, production, QA, quality insurance, QC, quality control. The last one is understanding how process safety activities are influenced by the process safety culture. It's the same for ICHQ9, depends on how your GMP culture is being established. Your quality system is being established. 
the level of understanding of that process through the entire organization. And the last principle is both, appro both, both approaches, they demand um, a very formal collection of information on documentation as well. Both approaches, they control, they have, they control documentation, they have a control document management. They have a certain guidelines that needs to be in, compl needs to be in compliance to, to have that information according to different regulations. And that is that um, FDA, in case of uh, GMPs is looking for, how you control your, your information, how you identify pro, um, uh, potential hazards that, it, that maybe they're gonna jeopardize the safety of the patient, how you, how you uh, adjust or how you uh, manage modifications without jeopardizing the safety of the patient, how you control your documentation. It's the same for process safety. For process safety, you, you're gonna change a procedure, for example. So in, um, in, 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 uh, in GMPs, you need to have a control of that change, needs to be authorized. It's go through a process. The same for process safety. You cannot change that procedure and then, and then um, put it in place right away. No, it needs to go through a process as well for a different reason to prevent um, and protect the safety of the, of, of the employee and the environment, but has the same, uh, it's the same rigorous system of documentation that that company needs to follow. That is the reason why it's very important and actually it's a value added for, um, for companies that they have a process safety, they can use that uh, knowledge to be, tra uh, know uh, that knowledge and be transferred to, uh, to QA. So you, ha you have process safety already implemented in your company. The implementation of ICHQ9 shouldn't be difficult because you have that culture already. The only difference is the, uh, the, uh, the final goal that is to protect the safety of the patient. But the similarities are the same. The culture actually is the same. And actually, if you have a good process safety culture so your, your quality culture should be good as well. This diagram uh, shows the, how the um, quality risk management process work for ICH, ICHQ9. That is not different from the um, risk-based process safety. So as we said on the last slide, so uh, performing the process hazard analysis we need to identify the hazards of each part of the process or activities. Identify the, co the consequences and the causes of those consequences. What safeguards we have to prevent those consequences. And then perform the risk assessment based on uh, probability and frequency of other companies, probability, frequency, and severity. And after that, how you will want to control that risk by recommending new, new uh, uh, action items to implement. How we're gonna follow those, those implementations that are effective or not. How we're gonna, uh, how we're gonna assess that effectiveness is conducting another uh, risk assessment. Now taking in account the new recommendations implemented. And uh, after one or two or three months, so you can perform that risk assessment and say, okay, it's effective. And obviously how it's gonna be effective, it's because your risk assessment is gonna be reduced. The number at the end is gonna be reduced. That's the effectiveness. So you review it and then you communicate also the, the, the risk and, and, and you manage that risk following this, 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 uh, this process, this diagram showed in this uh, slide. The most important component or a step that we need to perform before um, going to uh, the process hazard analysis, the process knowledge management. Uh, the same is uh, for the ICHQ9. It's to define the problem and the risk questions, including pertinent assumption and identifying potentials for the risk. And for the process uh, management system is the hazard identification and risk analysis 
So it's a collective term that encompasses all activities involved in identifying those hazards. So um, we need to evaluate the risks of the facilities to the life cycle to make certain risks to employees. The public or to the environment are consistently, consistently controlled within the organization of risk tolerance. That depends, obviously, in case of the FDA, is through the GMPs, and in case of the process safety, is through the uh, governmental regulations. For example, OSHA in the States, Minister of Labor in Canada, Environmental Department, APA in the United States, a Minister of Environment in Canada. So we need to define those problems. And um, one, that definition is what part of the process we want to analyze. Risk management, it should include a systematic process designed to coordinate, facilitate, and improve science-based decision-making with respect to the risk. This is very important because we need to define the process, how we're going to coordinate this knowledge, how we're going to generate that knowledge, how we're going to develop that, that, that knowledge, how we're going to communicate that knowledge, and how we're going to practice that knowledge. As you can see on the first uh, one of the slides, is uh, risk-based process safety has another pillar. The third one is manage the hazard. And, they have a, and that manage the hazard has a lot of components. One is management of change, the other one is safety practices. So it's the same for um, quality risk management. What is going to be your quality practices to prevent um, consequences of those hazards that, you, yeah, that are implicit on that process? How are you going to protect the, uh, the, the safety of the patient? That needs to co become an, an a daily practice and needs to be consistent. So the results at the end, they need to be consistent. They need to be, they need to follow the same process. Because if they follow different process that you can uh, have a lot of uh, deviations, they call in, in safety. And it's the same they call in, 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 uh, in, in, in uh, quality assurance. So having a lot of deviations that, that, that is a sign that your process is not consistent and doesn't uh, generate consistent results. And that shows to the authority and obviously shows to the company that there are a lot of discrepancies that they can generate hazards and they can compromise the, the safety of the public, in, the, in this case, the patient, and the other cases, the environment and the, and the, and the, and the workers that, are work, that they, they face those hazards uh, daily, in the daily basis. So it's a systematic process that needs to be designed to coordinate and facilitate and improve science-based decision-making with respect to the risk. Um, it's, an, it's very important, it's this term improved, actually, we can see it here. So obviously, uh, there is no a, a, a perfect system. So they're going to be, in a, one part of the process going to be corrective action and preventive actions. So it's up, up to the organization to establish the learning process from those uh, actions, for those deviations to avoid the occurrence of them again in the future. So define your learning process, the communication process from these deviations is very important. How it needs to be investigated. Define the investigation process to find the the causal factor, the causes that are, that are producing that deviation, and the root causes that involve management systems, involve training, involve resources, engineering, um, uh, the environment of the workstation, that's something that needs to be established very well because it's something that government, from the safety standpoint of view, and FDA, they're going to be looking for. So how are you going to prevent that with, a, with data and with a conscious and, and a systematic approach to determine the hazards and how you're going to reduce the risk of those. So how we initiate or we start uh, risk management? Uh, it's very simple. So we need to define the process and its notes. That's called from the process safety. And in ICHQ9 is define the problem and the read question. So uh, uh, this is very, very, very uh, important to take the knowledge from from the uh, from, from from process safety. So you, you you're gonna have a process. 
So you need to split the process in nodes, so in, in sub-processes. And then in each one has its, uh, its own particularity, its own nature. So the questions and the risks that you're going to be facing each one of those processes are very different. That's key. So this uh, risk management, this process has an analysis as well. They take time to perform. Week, a week or weeks to do that. But once you, you are familiar with the exercise, you're going to be capable to identify hazards through a systematic approach and you're going to know how to split your process when you design that for a new, new, new medications or for modification of existing medications. So it's very important to define the scope of the risk assessment. So how we're gonna how we gonna define those nodes? So first we need to define the process. So how you define that? So create a process flow diagram. That's it. that is not different from from QA. Uh, Q, uh, um, for the GMP time point of view, um, if you are in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, especially in the pharmacemical part. You need to, to have a, a process flow diagram. So how this product is gonna come from the raw materials, right? It's gonna go to the manufacturing areas, how it's gonna be produced, manufactured, and then how you're gonna get intermediate products, and then how you're gonna get the end, the, the finished product, and how it's gonna be commercialized. How it's gonna, I mean, in this case, your process stops once this product, this finished product is out of the, uh, of the company for this specific risk assessment. So we need to split the process into process that we said in the last slide that we call nodes. So it's the same steps for the, for the risk-based process safety. This is an example of uh, how we initiate a risk management in process safety. So we have the process flow diagram. So we split the process in nodes. That's the reason why you see uh, different colors in this uh, in this um, um, uh, diagram, that means it's it's by, it's being split by nodes, and each node has its particular its own particular questions, its own particular cost to be in compliance, um, particular procedures, and obviously different equipment. So that makes uh, your uh, your uh, your system more efficient. You can analyze all the processing ones. It's up to the company. But it's recommended to split the process in, in, in nodes because it's not the same to have a reactor that has its own nature and all hazards and all a product, uh, manufacturing parameters than a dryer. The dryer is different in operation, different in nature, different in equipment. And obviously your drying process is way different than your, uh, your re chemical reaction process in, in the chemical or pharmacemical industry. In the ph pharmaceutical industry, so it's very different you have liquids that you're going to mix uh, uh, to produce a cream, for example, that is going to be a tablet uh, uh, machine that is going to produce uh, tablets. So it's different, has a different nature. So it's better to split those processes. And then I start asking, uh, formulating those questions, design those questions to discover the consequence and the causes of that operation and what safeguards you have to reduce the the consequence, and then you uh, perform the hazard and risk assessment. If the ha and then the result is high, um, you need to, to uh, recommend actions to be implemented. So how we initiate the uh, uh, management process information? Uh, so the process in, in, in process safety is called process safety information. And it's defined by um, and a, a, a lot of documentation such as management of change, incident investigations, corrective and preventive actions, standards and codes and regulations, uh, incidents from other industries, procedures is very important, process flow diagrams, and uh, PNIDs. In, from the standpoint of your ICHQ-9, I would recommend to have procedures, obviously, process uh, information, what parameters are very are important to that process, process flow diagrams, PNIDs as well, CAPAS, and SOPs as minimum to start 
um, before um, to analyze that information before studying uh, the uh, the risk uh, assessment or pro or uh, process hazard analysis. Like I mentioned before, this is the uh, the information that we need to take in account: is green technical documents and specifications, process flow diagrams, PNIDs of the specific manufacturing process, specification for the design, fabrication, and installation of the process equipment, standard operation procedures. So something that we um, uh, uh, notice is the knowledge implies understanding, not simply the compiling data. In that respect, is the competency element complements the knowledge of the of this. In that it helps to ensure that users can properly interpret and understand the information that is collected as part of this element. So that means the people who's gonna be who's gonna be involved, who are being involved in the um, in the risk assessment, is to be uh, people that is competent in his in his or her specific areas. And that's the same practices for GMPs. So when you do the risk assessment for a specific process. So you need to have people from R&D that is possible, that they were involved with the process, people from Q&A, QC, um, people from the warehouse, people from production, obviously, engineering, and then together, and then you're going to have a facilitator, sorry, uh, so that's the pe person who's going to lead the, the, the assessment. And then they're going to start um, asking those questions to identify the consequence and the causes. Principles, maintain a dependable practice. Uh, so this approach cannot be applied without understanding of the hazard and risk, which still depends on the knowledge of the element. So that's the reason why I mentioned before, it's very important to have a team because each member of the team is an expert of the topic that this part is, is part of the, of the risk assessment. We need to establish a dependable practice to collect, maintain, and protect company process knowledge that helps to protect an important asset, which simply makes a good business sense. So, yep, so how are we going to protect that information? How are we going to um, keep that information updated? What is the information that is important for the business? And the process knowledge provides a foundation for long-term viability and continuous success of the business. A management system should be established to protect and promote the use of this information. So your process safety information is going to be split in many departments. So you need to have a system to identify that information what is the information, the content of the information, and who's going to be responsible for that information, and how that information is going to be communicated, and how that information is being executed on the, on the floor. So there is the five elements that you need to take in account and to maintain this, practice, this, this, this information current and available. Catalog process knowledge is a manner that facilitates retrieval, so make information available, available and provide a structure. So these SOPs, critical process parameters, transfer technology information, such as description of the process, steps of the process, equipment involved, process flow diagrams. Uh, in case of safety, that is the safety information, and in case of the ICHQ9, you, don't, you have the safety information, but to protect the patient. Toxicology, um, MSDSs. So another element of the process knowledge management is to protect and update the process knowledge. We have mentioned this through, through the webinar. So we need to control or limit the access to out-of-date documents. So that's um, on, uh, on, on, on GMPs, it's CFR Part 11. So how we control that information. Uh, ensure accura accuracy protect against inadvertent change, and protect against physical or electronic removal or, misfe or misfeeling. Support efforts to properly manage change. To manage change. So in other words, uh, on the pharmaceutical industry, on the GMP side, so it's the same. So you have your controls, you control your procedures, how you update, how it's been approved, how these changes have been communicated to the 
to the to the employees to the or departments affected for that for those changes and how you uh, keep the outdated documents uh, and um, protected and not be used again in, in uh, on the floor is the same for process safety so that process also I think you have already implemented on 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 on, on your company so that's the way that we need to follow and uh, and then that's considered protecting your information so once you have your C, C uh, GMPs in place you are covered on on, on this uh, point so one of the most important <laughs> or maybe is the most important part of the uh, risk uh, management is how we're going to use that process knowledge so first you need to define a training um, system to uh, come to start communicating those changes on that knowledge to the to the to the departments affected or involved with these uh, specific processes, how the information is going to be available, what is important to understand, how to access that knowledge is going to be by computer or is gonna, or the procedures are going to be on the binder. How you going to control those versions? It's very important. CGMP is actually they have that requirement, how you're going to control, how you identify that document, and how you're going to uh, um, keep that document um, out of being um, changed uh, without any um, authorization. So how to do that if a change is made, how to update the information, when it's going to be updated, how often needs to be reviewed. Policy governing the document control. So you need to have part of the CGMP, some part of the process uh, safety management is how you're going to control that documents. Your documents on your company, how is it going to be controlled? Ensure awareness and ensure that process knowledge remain useful. So you can create beautiful procedures, beautiful um, technical uh, uh, technology tech transfer uh, documentation, but you, you don't use that information, you're going to have a lot of deviations. That's the fact. So make sure that all your employees, all the people who are involved in that manufacturing process, understand the information, when it's going to be the, when they can get the information. Uh, um, they understand correctly the information and the most important, how they need to use it. Um, by having said that, it's the it's a systematic approach that like we we said that you're gonna you implement this type of uh, policies in your in in in, in your uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, there are chances that all the capas um, and deviations they're gonna be decreased because one thing is to have a correct uh, a corrective actions and preventive actions and another thing is to have a predictive actions. It's very important to mention that in this slide. Pre predictive action is something that when you have this process in place and reviewing the, your risk assessments, you, cap, you can predict. So your prediction actions, your prediction program, when you start implementing these um, actions, these recommendations, obviously it's way different that to have corrective actions that is now something occurred and that corrective action is coming from a deviation. Predicted actions, they are not coming from deviations. It's something that you are predicting through the risk assessment. And it's better to have those ones instead of the other ones. Or at least your predictive action needs to be higher than your corrective actions and higher than your preventive actions. So that's the benefit of this program. Always you need to make the, the documents available. That's very important and, access, and accessible. Information needs to be located, easy to locate. Um, we need, uh, the most important thing on the procedure on any, on any process information is our uh, employees need to have a high confidence of the information that is put in there. How we can achieve that well, uh, uh, for example, uh, you start uh, developing a procedure, so give, give the procedure to an operator or a other person that are, who, who's involved in that, who's going to be affected for that change or for that procedure, and ask him about his opinion. 
or her opinion. And then you're going to know if that the information that you are including on that uh, standard operation procedure is accurate or not. Once you have that feedback, you, um, um, you, you change the procedure, you fix, you fix the document and, um, and then goes for approvals and then you can start training people. Uh, if you uh, approve a procedure, and put it in the floor or put it on the floor <coughs> with information sorry that is not accurate you're going to ca cause stress on 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 the operators and obviously the relationship is going to be deteriorated so it's very important also to establish the relationship with the operators that's the uh, part that ICHQ9 or or, or risk based process safety doesn't mention don't mention sorry so learn the process as well by going to the floor and asking and looking for that information and obviously communicate the change because something that is uh, that uh, people that employees um, make them um, disappointed it's when you make a change and it's not communicated and also that is going to create a deviation right away on the spot if you don't communicate the changes it's a deviation so now you're creating deviations for no reason. So have this, um, have this um, uh, system, system defined and how it's going to be communicated, how it's going to be changed, how it's going to be approved, how it's going to be located, and when it's going to be. Because in an audit from FDA, they ask when you can find the, the, uh, the, the information and your operator doesn't know, it's a deviation. And you should have it on your system, your deviation and CAPA system. And it's a corrective action. How you gonna how you gonna get the, the information accessible? But is there is no need to have that deviation at all because it needs to be established before. So this is there are three main questions that you're gonna use a lot during the risk assessment or process hazard analysis. What can go wrong? That's the hazard identification. How bad could it be? That's the consequence. And how often might it happen? That is the risk assessment. Probability and severity of, like I said, other companies is probability, frequency, and severity. So the hazard identification and risk analysis, they call, sometimes they call HIRA, I-H-I-R-I. It's a collective term that encompasses all activities involved in identifying hazards so how, what can go wrong? And evaluating risks at the facility. So how could, bad could it be? And how often might it happen? Uh, through the life cycle of the product and on the process, to make sure that that risk to the employees or to the public are consistently controlled with the organization's risk tolerance. So. Uh, now the organization needs to define on their policy what risk is going to be tolerated. Um, normally, um, and we want to see uh, um, on the following slides, there is a criteria to to have to that, that defines that tolerance. So when a company identifies or defines an uh, an activity to be undertaken, that company likely wants the activity to be performed correctly. And consistently, principles of the CG and peace and the same for safety over the life of that process and other similar processes. So this um, dependable practice is going to make sure that you have a correctly and a consistent process, systematic approach. So you need to define, you need to integrate these activities into the life cycle of the project or processes, not having separated processes. For example, now in your, um, in your management of change, if you don't have a hazard and risk assessment, would say you're going to install a new, a new tablet machine. So what is better to create a new procedure for risk, uh, for hazard identification and risk assessment of, um, of that specific change 
or include that part on that current on the current procedure of uh, management of change is including that on the management of change there is no reason to have another procedure that is going to create a hassle and have hundreds of procedures that at the end companies that get lost so use your current systems and update those ones with the, these elements that's the thing that we need to do so we don't need to create a new new a new a new procedures we need to train people for sure with the change for uh, because of the changes and start practicing those changes and in, i mean by implementing um, these assessments but you need to create more of documentation uh, another i mean another procedure no so um, that is called building in the culture building in the process so and then that is um, that avoids something that is very important you don't create separated entities separated organizations into the organization and that's the reason why departments they fight all the time so build in build these practices into your current system and then you're going to have one so who are the participants on the risk assessment or any process hazard analysis when well, you're going to have a process leader that is not the leading the assessment is the leader is the process leader who has all the information the pertinent information process safety information or process information in case of the ICHQ9 and then you're going to have engineering you're going to have production you're going to have process engineers in case of uh, process safety you're going to have the safety department and then you're going to have a facilitator this facilitator is going to start asking the questions and you're going to have a scribe the scribe is going to is going to populate the uh, the form on the hazard uh, on the uh, risk assessment the facilitator is going to lead the discussions he's going to lead the people to have a, a a civilized discussions and productive uh, risk assessment and then bring r and is there is if there is necessary as well so bring all the people that you consider is necessary to participate on this to have a very uh, success uh, risk assessment another principle for um, once once you implement the risk assessment is uh, assess the risk and make respect decisions that's very important now you have the data so it's not I believe on this or I believe on that. No, you have data. You have you have you have you have gone through a systematic approach of identification of the hazards and the, and performing the risk assessment to make a decision. So you are evaluating your data, your process safety, your process information, process safety information as well in case of the um, risk-based process safety. And with that data, you can make a better judgments. You can bet better better. Um, better recommendations so that's the benefit of this and that's the fda in case of uh, uh, um, gmpc is going to be looking for how you make those decisions in base of what you are making those ones what is the information that is behind of that to make that judgment that judgment is in compliance with the regulations and the standards is in compliance with the cgmps that's the FDA is looking for, or your or your um, local health uh, agencies. Also, these agencies or FDA is going to be looking for what is the uh, methodology that, they, that you used. It's going to be a hazard, hazard and operability. It's one. It's going to be a what if analysis. It's going to be a what if and hazard analysis. It's going to be a failure mode effect analysis, fault tree analysis, hazard analysis, and critical control points that's more for the uh, uh, food industry which one of those and also the the employees are going to be participating on this um, on this analysis on this assessment sorry they need to be trained on this on these methodologies your facilitator your scribe your process uh, the, the process leader the en engineers production qa qa qc r d all the people that is considered to be uh, to con uh, that is considered to be participants on this process they need to be trained on this in these methodologies as well obviously facilitators and describes the they're going to have um, and process lead, and process leads they're going to have uh, um, a more comprehensive training of these methodologies 
but the other guys that they, they come to participate on this process, they're going to have the basics and they're going to have the understanding how these methodologies work. And each methodology has its own nature. So, for example, my recommendation, if you're going to analyze, you're going to assess hazards and, and you're going to perform risk assessments in a, in a uh, digital control systems, so use fault tree analysis. If you're going to assess activities or tasks or uh, nodes on a specific process, you have hazard and operability studies. You can use what if analysis, you can use what if and hazards as well. It's a combination of those ones, but people need to be trained on those. This is the flow on how to start performing uh, hazard and operability studies or what if and hazards. So it's very important uh, to select the node of the path. We, we talked about it already. Describe the design intent, select the words guide deviations, uh, what, what if it happened if we add more chemical than the other one? What happens if, if the temperature goes up or goes down? Uh, what happens if we, um, we have temperature more than 20, de uh, 20 degrees above or 20 degrees below? Uh, if that deviation is possible, yes or no? And have the words uh, deviations be examined as well. Um, this um, this flow diagram is more for a, a pharmacochemical um, or pharmaceutical um, industries. So um, I will put an example. We select the vessel. We discuss the product change over by applying guide words to the parameter. How are you gonna get those guide words? Is that the, is the reason it's very important that uh, the person that I that I mentioned before on the slides get the training because on that training they're gonna tell you what what guide words need, you need to use. And if you buy the uh, software, that software, they have those, those words. So um, you don't need to memorize them, but you need to know how each guide word works and for what specific scenario. You identify, after that, you identify causes, consequences, and actions required. So now you select the process. You review in three parts. You review how you charge your um, charging procedures, how you charge your uh, raw materials, have you applied the, the guide words? You record the causes and consequences and have all the guide, the guide words applied and all the recommendations um, and safeguards um, uh, in, that, in that part. Second, now, once you DB review, how are you going to charge the, those raw materials? That is coming actually, they start from, from, uh, from the shipping and receiving. So how the material is being received, how we're going to avoid cross-contamination, how it needs to be identified the material. If there is not identified correctly, what's, what could happen, what is going to be the consequence, the causes when there is lack of training on the, or the procedure is not accurate. So once you have that, and now what's, that material has going to be weighted, right? And then what happens if the, um, the scale is not calibrated? What is going to be your tolerance? Plus, minus one gram or plus minus one, plus minus 0 0.01 gram. I don't know. That depends on the company. Second, you review the operation. Now, okay, what type of operation I have? It's a tablet operation. It's a liquid. It's a solid operation. It's a liquid operation. It's a packaging operation. And then now, once we have the finished product, but the, the intermediate product, when it's going to go? So now we're going to discharge to the packaging area. Uh, what type of the equipment we wanna, is going to be involved, what form is going to be be disposed, like it's going to be a tablet, it's in a, in a solid, it's going to be dispensed to an, a, to an, a, um, um, an a aluminum foil, um, how's going to be, all that, all those packaging uh, uh, steps, how we're going to put it, um, what's going to happen, um, how we can reduce that waste. And then once we have the finished product from, from packaging, how's it gonna go to the, um, to the warehouse for the, on the finished product area? How's it gonna be identified? How's it gonna be counted? How's it gonna be controlled? Especially there are controlled products. How's it gonna be locked? How's it gonna be um, uh, secured? So all those type of questions needs to be on the hazard and risk assessment. So that follow these uh, three steps on the, um, and how to do the uh, risk identification. 
Here is, is an, uh, we have an example of the um, hazard on operability study um, record. So the node, um, we use a RoboFit. It's a Robo portable filter. It's an old technology. Uh, in this case, uh, was located in plan one, two, three, four, five, from one to eight plan facility, sorry. Last review, it uh, was in 2010. So uh, that was 2015. So it needs to be reviewed again. No modifi modifications were done before. So, so you, you have the deviation, for example, uh, one of those is low flow nitrogen. Cause operator forgot to open the nitrogen feed valve. Consequence is explosion due to the accumulation of solvent vapor. This is a pharmacochemical um, operation. Safeguard, safeguard. So we have the uh, procedure, but it's effective or not. So risk ranking is likelihood and severity. So uh, the risk ranking goes to three. So what is the recommended action? was consider to optimize the blanketing system of the robo filter. Responsible, responsible who's going to be uh, uh, as, uh, assigned to do that change. That maybe is going to be engineering. So I'm sure. So that's the, per, the person that is going to be assigned to that. On the responsible person, the thing that I recommend to avoid um, discussions during the, uh, the <laughs> during the sessions, uh, always assign managers or directors of the departments. And the reason why is very simple. Um, as a facilitators, we cannot assign uh, work to other people. We don't have that power. So assign to the managers, but always communicate to them that it's going to be assigned to them, to directors or managers of the department, because them they can assign because they they can assign the job to the to certain to their people. Also, fac facilitators know. So always assign to them, and uh, you're going to avoid a lot of uh, discussions in, in in the session. So at the end, uh, the responsible of that department needs to needs to allocate that job for sure and then uh, it's gonna be, and then you you're gonna have a, a you're gonna have a, a more productive uh, session avoiding this type of discussions and here this is a, a matrix on the consequence on severities so um you, uh, as you can see on um obviously you have a risk uh, ranking in in red or in yellow so something needs to be implemented to reduce to to go to green so this matrix is um, something for this course. It's a proposal that is come from the um, from uh, uh, from the process safety, but for um, IC for CGMPs, it's something that the company needs to design, where they are considered um, um, uh, a major hazard or a critical ha a critical hazard, moderate or minor, depending on the frequency and probability and severity. And then you have some severities here, and you can define what is um, on that severity. For example, um, uh, so you have legal, so low um, legal issue, minor issue, or something that you can go to court, for example, of FDA can um, can um, um, assign forms for a trees, and that's gonna pretty much jeopardize your operation. So th those type of consequences you need to de define on your own matrix, and then the score of each one of those ones and then that's going to be needs to be ready for the uh, process for the uh, risk assessment because that that criteria needs to be used on 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 on, the, on, on that session so now the risk evaluation and uh, and uh, uh, the risk evaluation and after implementation is called risk control so we need to evaluate the risk so once you have the the the, the recommended action on the same Mm, session you can risk rank again so actually if you want to have a success um, risk assessment and risk control you need to conduct the risk ranking three times one is when you when the with this existing safeguardings that you have or the current uh, procedures that you have the current um, engineering measures that you have in your process once uh, if that is the risk is high so now you need you recommend the action and then on the same session you uh, risk rank that recommended action that in this case that uh, you're going to believe yeah we can reduce this and after a period of time i would say two or three months you come back to that action and you say yeah has been affected we have decreased deviations or we haven't had deviations so now you have you perform another risk ranking and now it's going to go to green so that is a risk evaluation and control 
and that's something that FDA is going to be looking for uh, for when inspect your uh, CG, uh, C, uh, GMP's um, uh, system, and it's something that in the, in safety they, they always the um, the uh, OSHA uh, is looking for how you control that. So that's the reason why two areas, like I said in the beginning, and that's the reason why I made this webinar. It's you can the safety process can add the value to CGMPs by adding this experience to this area. So you now use that experience to evaluate the risks and the hazards that can impact the safety of the patient at the end. Now we're going to talk about risk communication. So managing the risk helps uh, the company or a facility having a, a, a sustained long-term, easy and free and profitable operations. So the principles that we have on this is prudently operating and maintaining process that pose the risk, managing changes, and preparing for responding to and managing incidents that do occur. So now you, you have the system that you have an incident or you have a deviation, now you can use this systematic approach to find, um, to, to determine corrective actions and, and, pre, and, and preventive actions based on data and based on a hazard and risk assessments. So now you have, uh, you are assessing what happened in base of that data or in base on that information. And that is going to help you to prevent that the incident occur again by obviously uh, uh, implementing preventive actions. But like I said, also try to um, uh, implement predictive actions as well to predict uh, that certain scenarios. So investigation, uh, incident investigation needs to be a formal process. It needs to include the staffing, performing, documenting and tracking investigation of process safe, or process safety incidents or C, or CGMP process. So you need to track those incident investigations, how it needs to be, how it's going to be communicated and what you learned. Nowadays, the FDA is asking for three things on the incident investigation. You have the process, you identify causal factors. So in other words, you have the flow chart of the incident. And then you go through that root cause analysis of those uh, causal factors to implement or to recommend actions that is going to avoid that occurrence happening in the future. That is asking for a systematic approach to investigate incidents. So one of the... Um, a characteristic of the incident investigation is we need to collect the appropriate data because if we don't have the right data or the right documentation so the incident investigation is not going to be success and that is going to help us to identify causal factors it's going to allow us to go through the root cause analysis and have a better uh, uh, a better analysis a better judgment remember on the last slide i mentioned that fda is going to be looking for and it's not different on incident investigations. Um, something that is very important is I use appropriate techniques to investigate incidents. Um, I won't uh, recommend on this webinar which one, um, but if you want to send me, send me and uh, uh, put your question in the comment section of this um, of the webinar in LinkedIn or in my YouTube channel or in my Facebook page, page I can recommend you one of those. Um, uh, now, personally, I'm used, uh, I'm going to do it, okay. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm been using uh, Taproot. And um, apparently, um, uh, Taproot has been welcomed by the FDA. So, um, contact the people from Taproot. Oh, there is another technique uh, of investigation, but you need to contact these people. You need to make sure that FDA has approved those techniques. And then, all, and then after, you need to train the people who's going to be performing and participating in incident investigations. So um, that's very important. One of the things that FDA is going to be looking for is uh, the linking between the causes and recommendations and how you do that. 
through the root cause analysis of each causal factor. Uh, the results of the investigation is uh, resolve the recommendation. So once you recommend something on the investigation, it needs to be implemented, it needs to be restranked. Like I said, before implementing and after implementing, we need to communi uh, communicate the findings internally and externally and maintain incident investigation records. So in that, by having said that, we need to prepare an investigation report. So you need to define the report form or the, or, or, or the content in an, a procedure. So what's going to be the content of that, of that um, uh, incident investigation report? So you need to define the template, in other words. Um, teams that are going to participate, people who provides the data, like I said, the flow, the flow diagram of the incident, you need to demonstrate that you go through the causal factors and root cause analysis. So the, the, the technique that I was recommended um, offers that. Uh, you can provide that type of uh, information in a very systematic approach. And, um, and like I said, FDA has approved that, but it's only a recommendation. Um, it's not intent to sell the, the technique. The only way to see common thread, it's linking the incident data to the trending of the data. So in other words is, we need to identify who's generating that trending, where it's coming from, why it's coming from, and how it's coming from. So you need to look across multi multiple facilities. So you are having the same trending in the other processes, for example. Uh, analyze what measures have been, they had, what uh, recommendations have been implemented in the other investigations. And this trending uh, is going to help you particularly in um, incidents that have high or medium occurrences. Either they occur a lot or they, or, or they occur three times a week. That is too much. But it occurred twice a week. So it's going to help you to identify those trends. Uh, these incidents usually do not justify an analysis based on consequences or a single occurrence. So when you have a, an, a, an a incident that you are investigating that has a high risk, so it's not only one cause, it's more causal factors, it's more than one. And that's when the data needs to start being uh, identified and analyzed. And um, that's the reason why you need to bring other investigation reports in, um, to the to the investigation to analyze those, those trends, because you are having um, the same and, and a, 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 a personnel that is not following the procedure in one process and happening in the in the, in the other one that it, they are completely different in a different rooms. So something is happening. One, your people are not understanding the training correctly. The training material is not appropriate for that. Or you or a company is not making sure that the person that, that needs to follow that procedure understood the training properly. Or that training hasn't been evaluated properly either. So there are many reasons. That's the reason why FDA is asking for a causal factor analysis and root cause analysis as well. So you need to go through the root cause analysis of those causal factors. And like I said before, it depends of training, procedures, environment, management system, and communication, those five. Hazard and operation study is a living document. It needs to be um, updated uh, in uh, four situations. The one is the modification of the existing process. So it's the same for ICU, ICHQ9. Uh, when new products are introduced or new processes. Uh, also, um, ICHQ9 doesn't require to review the process hazard analysis or risk assessment that they call it in that way every five years. Um, but the, um, uh, 
process safety management uh, according to OSHA in the United States. They need to be reviewed every five years. So um, I, something that I, 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 I wanted to suggest to, uh, to uh, the experts or the specialists on the QA department, so it's, you don't have any products, you don't have a modifications of the existing processes, um, review your uh, um, risk assessment every five years, uh, at least, or if you consider that it should be earlier, that's okay, but um, review needs to be performed. Um, if you don't uh, review your uh, process hazard analysis or risk assessments every five years, uh, you need to return it after 10 years. So if you don't review it, it needs to be erased and redo it again. That means you need to review process safety information as well. That's the first thing that you need to do. Identifying and using a relevant process safety matrix, or in this case, quality matrix for the um, ICHQ9, um, is going to uh, allow to establish performance and efficiency. Uh, that it's, um, it's going to allow us to monitor the uh, near real-time effectiveness of the, uh, of the process or any specific process. Um, too many matrix can overwhelm the organization and too few will not provide the sufficient data in real-time or near real-time to monitor the, the, um, the risk assessment uh, system. Or a, a process or a, a process safety uh, system in the case of the, the uh, process safety management or engineering departments. Um, so the facilities or the experts uh, from QA in case of the uh, uh, ICHQ9, they need to define the appropriate numbers of uh, matrix that is going to be according to the nature of your processes. So also use practical format and selecting the best media for users, the best ways to communicate to. To the, to the personnel on the floor that is going to uh, allow them to um, know more about uh, your system and how your system is performing and how they can uh, act, uh, contribute to the continuous improvement of, uh, of these uh, risk assessments as well. To measure the, uh, the audits, uh, one element is practice. So, um, Make sure that uh, the implementation is consistent. What is the criteria that need to be implemented? The frequency of these audits as well. The format, questions, and topics. And also identify when audits are needed. Um, to set up an audit, you need to define the scope of the audit. What's going to be the, uh, the uh, topics and the elements that are going to be audited on your risk management system. And in function of that, you need uh, collect information, matrix, investigations, uh, corrective actions, preventive actions, deviations, etc. All the, doc the pertinent documentation to make sure to, sorry, to verify how the system is working. If everything is being implemented on, on time, uh, all the, uh, the recommended actions, corrective actions, and preventive actions are implemented. Um, make sure that the, the, uh, the, the personnel involved in these processes, they, uh, they understood correctly what is uh, what needs to be achieved. All, that, all those um, activities that need to be taking place to make an audit uh, success.